What causes civil war? While the number of new civil wars may not have increased since the mid-1990s, their relative importance has. Civil wars are now both more numerous and deadlier than interstate war. They represent the biggest threat to international peace today. There are three general types of theories on the origins of civil war. Grievance, greed, and resources. To summarize, grievance-based theories focus on economic inequality and ethnic difference as sources of conflict. Greed-based theories focus on the desire by groups to capture sources of revenue. And resource-based theories focus on militant groups' ability to organize and fund themselves. This video describes these theories in more detail and provides context on how to evaluate them. To begin with, grievance-based theories focus on why people are so angry that they are actually willing to go to war. High levels of poverty in a country, low GDP, and high levels of inequality are both correlated with higher levels of civil war internationally. Economic grievances can provide a way for rebel leaders to organize and motivate followers, as Tedger argued in Why Men Rebel. And it's certainly true that class conflict contributed to civil war in Angola, Nepal, and Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, among other places. Ethnic diversity can also provide a source of grievance, especially when combined with economic inequality. These arguments are most commonly associated with David Horowitz, who wrote the seminal book, Ethnic Groups in Conflict. While scholars do not find a statistical correlation between measures of ethnic fractionalization and civil war, there is some evidence that in cases where either one large dominant ethnic group or a small minority ethnic group controls the government to the exclusion of all other groups, that this can actually contribute to conflict. Ethnic diversity appears to matter when it provides the foundation for an unequal distribution of resources between groups. For example, when the Syrian government favors the Alawite minority over Sunnis and Kurds. It also matters when it becomes the means to mobilize groups for political ends. Daniel Posner, in his article on the political salience of cultural difference, shows that differences between ethnic groups alone don't lead to political conflict. Only under certain circumstances, and Posner points to the relative size of a group in the country, does ethnicity become a source of prejudice and political discord. Just one side note on measures of diversity. There are a bunch of different ways to do this, but the most common way is called fractionalization. That is a numerical representation of the number and size of ethnic, linguistic, and or religious groups in a country. Other measures will look at their relative size. Is there one dominant group and a bunch of small groups, for example? or their geographic concentration. This is, do different ethnic groups live together or apart? All of which might actually matter to how groups relate to each other. Moving on to greed-based theories, these focus on the financial incentives to participate in a civil war. These incentives can be at the micro or macro level. Paul Collier and Anka Hoefler argue that in poor countries, it is easy to recruit members of armed militias because the money they might earn from conflict is more than what they might earn from farming or other economic activity. A different greed-based motivation focuses on the role of natural resources. Rebels will seek to take possession of valuable resources such as oil and then profit off them. The easiest way to think of this is in terms of conflict diamonds, which funded the civil war in Sierra Leone, among other places. Similar problems are now arising with trade in rare minerals, like tantalum, that are used in the production of smartphones. This has been contributing to conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, amongst other places. And while some scholars may argue that rebel armies cannot loot petroleum fields uh, because they don't know how to operate them, as you read in the Bates article, uh, unfortunately they underestimate human creativity and ingenuity. Not only did the Islamic State successfully target and operate oil fields in Iraq and Syria, but the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta successfully disrupted access to Nigeria's offshore oil fields by targeting the trucks shipping easy-to-sell refined products from upstream oil facilities. And trade does not need to be legal to fund war. The FARC and right-wing paramilitary groups fought intensely for control over coca fields during Colombia's civil war. Finally, Resource-based theories focus not on why people rebel, but how. They focus on opportunities to organize against the government. For example, James Fearon and David Layton argue that three factors contribute to civil war. Weak governments, difficult geography, and a large population. These three things provide people either motivation or opportunity to join a movement. 
Weak governments uh, may either not crack down on rebels or crack down too hard. Geography will make it hard to attack rebel groups in mountains. And population just provides a lot of people to fight. There is some overlap between resource-based theories and greed-based theories, in that they both acknowledge that rebel movements require resources to survive. Resource-based theories, however, define these needs more broadly. A resource could be petroleum, but it could also be a social network, a particularly resident ideology, or a difficult-to-reach base. The key is the focus on how rebel movements build support among civilian populations, how they overcome coordination problems that would otherwise discourage people from getting involved. This support from the population, then, is what allows one side to win a civil war. There are many ways to assess the validity of these theories. Statistical analysis, as Fearon and Leighton do, can provide context on overall trends. What relationships do we see between potential causes of civil war and its actual incidents? They find, for example, a general relationship between low levels of economic development and a higher likelihood of civil war. But you could also compare two cases, as Posner did. While neither Zambia nor Malawi experienced civil war, ethnic prejudice between two identical groups is higher in Malawi where the relatively large size of ethnic groups makes appealing to ethnicity a useful way for politicians to mobilize. This will then provide you context on when these general trends hold and how they do and don't actually matter and operate. There are elements of truth to each theory, but which one applies in which context is what you all will have to evaluate.